I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Hey, I am so excited about this podcast that I'm about to do. I grew up with Jim Norton, and now he's got a Netflix comedy special. He's been on all my favorite comedy shows. He's just a world-famous comedian and genius, and we're going to be talking all about it, but we grew up together, and this is the first time we've seen each other probably in uh, about 22 years or so. So, uh, But my producer tells me I have to give you a warning. So this is the warning. Before we get started, I just want to let you know that if you're listening to this episode with your kids in the car or somewhere nearby, it may be best to save it for later because this episode is explicit. Jim Norton is hilarious. I think you'll enjoy the show. I certainly had fun doing it. But some of the content is explicit. Thanks. And now here's the show. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. FreshBooks is ridiculously simple cloud accounting software that will help you cruise through tax season. It keeps all of your cash flow details in one place so you know exactly what your income is. And their mobile app allows you to take pictures of your receipts and organizes them for later, which makes claiming expenses a total breeze. To get started with a 30-day free trial, go to freshbooks.com forward slash James and enter the code James in the how did you hear about us section. If you want to find the perfect hire, you need to post your job on all the top job sites And now you finally can. With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post your job to 100 or more job sites all with a single click. Just post once and quickly screen candidates from all different job sites. You can rate them and hire the right person fast. So right now, my listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free by going to ZipRecruiter.com slash James. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash James. Today on the James Altucher Show. We're starting this off from a foundation where I knew you as always being an order of magnitude funnier than the average human being. So we're, we're starting off with the foundation that you had this natural talent and quick wit and so on. My style is more I'm vomiting on myself and I'm picking up hunks of it and talking about it. Because if it's about you, then people can relate. Oh yeah, that's happened to me. And it's, it's kind of a safe way for people to experience their own hypocrisy by having you tell the truth they project it onto you on the stage and i tell them i'm I'm also like inconsistent like you got to tell on yourself like like what gives me the right to judge who am i to act like i've never done anything sleazy or i've never said anything sleazy so i make fun of myself i give my own personal examples but i think if i'm doing that at least i'm being truthful and i'm not coming from a place of i'm better than that guy like who am i So I'm here with Jim Norton. Jim, how's it going? I'm good, buddy. How are you? 
Jim, excellent. You know, first off, I'm going to give the intro first and then the reveal second. Sure. So the intro is you've got uh, your new Netflix special, Mouthful of Shame. It's a comedy special. It's excellent. Thank you. I've seen you on maybe everything you've been on, uh, but most most recently you've been on Inside Amy Schumer or Louie. I, I actually only first saw you on Lucky Louie, but you had been doing stuff before then. Um, and then uh, I've read your book. You have two New York Times bestsellers. You're like you've you've been doing everything, and also you you were on Opie and Jim. Now you've got like Jim Norton and Sam, Sam Roberts. Roberts. You have all these radio shows. What? And then you had a, a, a talk show on Vice. What don't you do? It seems like you took the umbrella of comedy and you do everything with it. I don't do anything that lasts. Like the things I do are are temporary. Like I want to get a show on the air that sticks around for a little while. I think that would be fun to do. Like uh, Lucky but, Louie was one season done. Um, Comedy Central, tough crowd, two seasons done. I'm like, I'm like the kiss of death. Like, if, if I'm involved with the project, Amy Schumer. I mean, she, she's the only one that had anything that lasted that I was on. So I would like to get my own show on that, that lasts for a little while. And you, what about? Uh, do you feel like the radio stuff, like Jim and Sam, like you think that's going to last and that could be a big thing? I think so. Yeah, I'm under contract for two years, and we we have a decent amount of listeners, so. The company's happy with it. I'm happy with it, and Sam is. So I think it'll be around for a while. I mean, there's no reason for them to get rid of us. So, so there's a couple of things I want to talk about. But first off, I want to mention that I first met you when we were 10 years old, yep. and it was your first day of fourth grade. You like moved mid year, right into, into Halloween, North Brunswick. Uh, fourth grade. Yep, Halloween. Yeah, and I remember you came in, and you and I could just picture it because you were sitting like in the second or third row. And it was your first day. You were like the new kid. You're supposed to be quiet, and you were like hilarious. You was were, I really? I don't even yeah, remember. You were you were you were making everyone laugh so hard, like my stomach was hurting. And and even you remember Mrs. Osborne was the teacher. I do, yeah. A, and she even said you're going to be a comedian. She said it that first day. I'm telling you, I remember. Wow, it. I don't remember that because I'm... I remember I saw you on Lucky Louie like 30 years later, and I'm like, oh my god, the fourth grade teacher said he was going to be a comedian. Now I could see he's wow. a comedian. So, so I don't, you started off already in order, like you could see the difference between talent and skill. Cause obviously you evolve into skill, but the talent was there from the beginning. Like, do you think it was like, did you have this awkwardness the first day of school? So you, you, you dealt with it by being funny and that, you know, turned you on. It must be that, you know, cause I was funny before, like in Edison, I think it's always that it's always a reaction to feeling awkward or like insecure or less than, so you just try to get something like, I'm not going to get pretty girls on my looks. I'm average looking. So I don't have the body of a jock. I don't have the build of a jock. I don't have the ability of a jock. How am I going to get girls? I don't have the coolness of a burnout. So it's all about girls. It's an evolutionary thing. Almost <laughs> always about girls. Gene Simmons said that about Kiss. He goes, don't listen to people who say they get into music for this and for that. It's for the girls. And that was why I wanted to do it initially. You just, you, you're funny because then the girls like you. And, the, and you don't get picked on. It's also a way to survive with other boys because you're not getting picked on because nobody wanted you to make fun of them. Well, we, want, we wanted to be friends with you. You were the funniest kid in the class like day one. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's like, well, the, but even the guys who would bully, you know what I mean? Like those guys, I didn't get too much bullying, I, a little bit because people didn't want to be made fun of. Like that was like a scale evener. Like if, if you could make fun of a guy who could punch you through a wall, for him, being made fun of was as bad as for me being punched was. So we just kind of left each other alone. So I think that was how I kind of survived when I was younger. So I wonder, like, I like obviously, like, of course, I have the good looks to, of course to get you any woman and everything. <laughs> but like, I, I don't know how I dealt with my awkwardness. Like, the I brains. Was, yeah, maybe. Like, I mean, uh, it, but it certainly didn't prevent the bullies from like punching me through a wall. Like, they didn't think I was gonna like outsmart them, right? Like, electrocute them or something. Yeah, bullies aren't scared of intelligence; they're intimidated by it another way. But they, but they know that in that moment, their muscle. But if you if you can make fun of them, you could like you couldn't humiliate them in that moment. I mean, as you you know, after the age of twenty one, that that's a big different story. They're still wearing their high school football jackets, right? And you're on to bigger and greater things. But in that moment. Being made fun of is humiliating for them. But so, so I want to kind of, I want to kind of. Um, I remember us playing chess. Yeah, we were in fourth like, grade. Yeah, like and then and then all throughout, like because then when did you? I I don't. We we didn't graduate at the same time because you were off. You know, I dropped out of high school into rehab. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so we went we went different paths right there. And then this is the first time we're seeing each other face to face since That's right. like senior year of high school. Since 1986. Yeah, and I think you're the only person I've seen from high school since since we graduated. Yeah. But um I also want to ask you like we'll get into the whole thing and comedy and career and I'm, I'm so fascinated by everything you've been doing. But I did um, for the first time stand up at a stand up club just last last Tuesday, oh. and and we texted a little bit about yeah. it. Yeah, and I asked you for advice, and you and you said um, the key is don't be like bombing is survivable, 
And that was like the key to kind of deal with that fear. And I remember, and I was listening to you with Joe Rogan and Joe Rogan said something kind of similar to you about jujitsu. Like once you realize you can get like beaten up, then like everything's okay. Right. And I wonder if this is like kind of common advice with everything. Like once you realize this kind of worst case scenario, you're good. I think so. Cause what stops us from doing stuff is being afraid. Like I'm, I'm, it's amazing. Like I'll tell you anything about my life, but being like, I can't dance in front of people. That that's humili. That's a humiliating level that I can't handle it. Like the idea of dancing in front, I forget, I would never ever do. So it's 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 just like, what's the worst that can happen? You think of it. What's the jujitsu? You could get hurt, but all right, usually you're not gonna die. Okay, comedy. You you obviously put your all into it, right? That was your life. And uh, what if you and, and uh, what if you get up on stage and you bomb and you think that you you've attached your whole self worth to your ability to make people laugh and people didn't laugh. Don't you feel like that's not survival? It's hitting your self-worth. Well, when you're younger, when you're first starting, if that's like, I left myself no safety net. I, you know, I got, I started when I was 21. I, I don't have a diploma. I got a GED three years after I got sober, but I have no high school diploma. So I knew it was going to be this or nothing. So I kind of left myself no safety net because I was like, I wasn't doing anything. I was working in warehouses. This is all I wanted to do. You know, and back then, I'm sure if it didn't work, I would have got a job. But back then, you're melodramatic. What job would you have gotten? Warehouse work. I mean, I wouldn't have been qualified. Or I would have had to go back to school because I just wasn't qualified to do anything other than, you know, I, like I didn't have any skills from school. Um, computers I sucked on. I had no ability to do computers. So I kind of said to myself, all right, well, if this doesn't work, you can always hang yourself. Which, I, again, would I have done that? Probably not. I probably just would have got a job. But, you know. Okay, let me ask you, in 12th grade, though, wasn't there like a suicide attempt? That was a senior, junior, senior year of high school. But they weren't even real. Like, so I, I cry looked, for help sort of thing? I, or attention. Even more, less Girl. dramatic attention. Uh -huh. um, you know, and I kind of mock myself for those moments. Because I think that we take our moments in life. One guy did something on this uh, act public radio uh, in Portland. And he goes, well, you're a little glib about it. Like, she was surprised. And I'm like, well, yeah, I was a douche. I mean, you, you can call yourself out when you're being melodramatic and you're not being genuine. Like, people who want to kill themselves, kill themselves. Well, also, it's funny you mentioned um, he, he was upset that you were being glib about it. Like, I find people uh, can't handle what other people tell the truth. And that's what, it seems like that's what you do. That's what a lot of comedy does. It's like a, what the best comics do is they kind of tell the truth that everyone else is uncomfortable with, but they still don't want you to do it. He, well, he was, I don't think he, he was a fan. So I don't think, I think he was like a little surprised. Like, wow, maybe I painted that wrong. I don't think he was mad, like, or upset. Like, I think he was like, oh, you're kind of glib about like, like shocked. Uh, but people do get uncomfortable with the truth. And there's a way to tell the truth too. Like, you know, I'm trying to be funny when I tell it usually. Um, when you tell them the truth, it's like, how do, you, how do I look in this dress? You're fat. Like, ugh. And that is the truth, but it's not good. You know, there's a way to say, like, you might want to, you know, it's like a joke. You have to deliver it a certain way or it's just, a, you're just making a statement. Well, well, and it seems like in your particular comedy, I think everybody has like a different style, right? They find their authentic voice and it comes out and, and they try to make it as funny as possible for if your profession's comedian. Sure. And so your particular thing is, if I'm going to analyze it from, from a distance, is... You tell the truth that's self-deprecating about you. You'll say the worst things about you, right. but you're not really going to go out there and like make fun of other people that much, unless well, it's like some stranger or it's part of a joke or whatever. I'll do it like I always kind of start with myself. Like if I want to make fun of Tiger Woods' sex scandal, I had to make fun. Like I'm a pervert. I text dirty, so I get it. Uh, Donald Sterling, hey, I've said shitty things in private. Mel Gibson, I've said shitty things to people. I've yelled at women. I've said horrible things in relationships. So I, I try to take out the self-righteous shit. That to me is where people go wrong. It's like we all sit there and look at other people and go, oh, how could they? And then they do it. It's like that's why Bill O'Reilly is right now looking like such a jerk. Now, by the time this is heard, I still will he have a job? I don't know. But that's why people love to watch someone like that fall and I could tell you that I talk dirty all day and nobody cares. Not even just because he's more famous, because I don't make a living pretending I'm not a certain way. If you're the guy who's telling everybody else, you gotta be this way and you gotta have a moral code. But yeah, you know, meanwhile, you're trying to show your hog to everybody at work. Well, what do you expect? People are happy to see you fall because you're full of it. And yet it's it's a hundred percent of the time. Like essentially everybody is a hypocrite almost yep. all the time. And it's so, across the board, too. People thought it was political, but the liberals, the conservatives, sex wrecks everybody. Like, everybody gets caught in sex scandals, meaning, like, you know, Anthony Weiner did, Elliot Spitzer did, Bill O'Reilly did. It goes across all ideologies. You know, uh, uh, the conservatives, the, the left, all of them get caught being perverted. 
Now, do you think like, like so obviously we're the same age. I, we, we slow down after a while. Like, do you find that, you know, you know, you just call yourself a pervert, but is that going to be like your thing when you're, when you're 60, you're going to be on stage, like talking jokes about perversion? Depends on where I'm at. Like, and it's funny, I, I did say that. And I, I actually said in my special that I got to stop saying pervert. Rogan goes, nah, you're a pervert, but you have you have standards. I don't even you know have, what that means. It feels like a 1970s word, pervert. It, 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 it is really <laughs> like 1950s. You know yeah. what I mean? The pervert will look at you in high school. Yeah, it's more like I have I have a I guess a high uh, capacity to talk dirty and to think about sex. I, mean, I shouldn't say perverted because I'm not lecherous. I don't victimize people. I'm not. You know, I don't trick people. No, you even talk about it both in Joe Rogan and yeah. even a little on your special. Like you're not, you're sober. You're not going after girls who aren't sober. You're not trying to get people. To, you're not manipulating any no. anybody to do anything they don't want to do. Like you're pretty upfront. Like like let's say you're with a girl who who it doesn't know everything about your background. She just knows you're like a comedian. She knows a little bit. Do they ever? And you, you again. I highly recommend people listen to the Joe Rogan podcast with you because you, you do talk a little about this. But does a girl ever find out about you and say, whoa, I got to yeah. now check for sexual diseases? And sure, <laughs> sure. There's a girl uh, on, on uh, it was uh, Tinder. Who, I tell a joke at the end of my special about how she said she Googled me. And that part of the joke, I, mean, I exaggerate the end of the joke, but that part of the joke is true. She was like, I Googled you and... Uh, you know, again, Google doesn't always tell the story, but it does tell a part of it. I've said a lot of those things, so and you you've written in the in sure. you know happy endings and yeah. I hate your guts. Like you you write all these incredible stories, and a lot of them are true. Uh, the majority they all have some truth in them. The only thing I, I've changed a couple of facts to protect people's confidence. Like I'm really right. weird. Like I'll tell you anything about me, but I won't talk about individuals. Like if a woman sends me a dirty picture. I'll never send it out, no matter what happens. If a woman tells me something, or a guy tells me something about his life, I'll never reveal that to other people. Like I, that, I have a lot of scruples about. So I've changed things in stories and in jokes and in books to protect people through timelines. Like if I cheated on a girl, which I have many times, but if I've cheated on a girl, uh, I might switch it in the joke, and, and the girl who I'm dating now will think I mean her. Like you know what I mean, like that type of stuff. But it's all about protecting the identity of people because I don't have the right to out people. Sure, and and look, I think that would make you less funny. Like I think it, so too. Like if it's about you, then people can relate. Oh yeah, that's happened to me, and I don't tell anybody. But and and it's, it's kind of a safe way for people to experience their own hypocrisy by having you tell the truth right there up there. They they project it onto you on the stage. And I tell them, but I tell them I'm I'm also like inconsistent. Like you got to tell on yourself. Like like what gives me the right to judge? Again, I use Tiger Woods as an example, or or even Donald Sterling, who yeah, the guy was a jerk off. But who am I to act like I've never done anything sleazy or I've never said anything sleazy? So I make fun of myself, I give my own personal examples, and then I'll shit on the person. But I think if I'm doing that, at least I'm being truthful and I'm not coming from a place of I'm better than that guy. Like who am I? You know what I mean? I have no right to to, to, to say, I'm not give a fucking sermon on the mount like I'm better than these people. I'm not. You know, and I think I think again, what makes your comedy unique to you is that you're pulling it from that that deep, uh, let's call it perversion for a second. Sure. But like like compare it to like a, a Louis C.K. I think he's doing more observations. Then he's digging into himself to kind of mix it together. He's not going as you're just to you're almost like a hundred percent. This is what I did, and it was totally screwed up. And then that, and then you turn you you turn your wit into making that into a joke. Louis is amazing at Louis is amazing at throwing up on other people. My style is more. I'm vomiting on myself, and then I'm picking up hunks of it and talking about it. It's just a different way of of doing it, for lack of a better example. Louis is kind of like Carlin. Uh, a, didn't do a whole lot of self-reveal. For him, it was all outward. Right. You know, and he was a genius. Um, Richard Pryor, self-reveal. Uh, uh, you know what I mean? And outward. So it, it all depends. It, it, whatever feels right. Like, you know what I mean? Like, Louis is such a great comedian. Like, he's really not an overrated guy. He's a really great comedian. Like, um, like there's there's one joke he did, which I don't see you doing a joke like this, so you, but you can correct me if I'm wrong. There's one joke he did in 2004, which I just think, as soon as I heard it, it was hilarious. It's He basically says... Do you ever feel like uh, farting and then you shit on your dad's face? That's very funny. <laughs> and and so I don't see you doing a joke like that because it has nothing to do with you. But that's like a classic joke. I would do something because it's absurd. It's, Louis is a very absurd guy. He's a, an absurd person. And he likes absurd jokes, things that have no 
rhyme or reason to them. Like just, you know, a little bit of a left turn and all of a sudden a vicious incest slap to the face. Like right. he loves that stuff. So occasionally I will do something absurdist like that, but that is much more his style than mine. And that's very funny. So, so, so back to like 17 years old, 18 years old, you go into rehab, you, you haven't had a drink since like 1985. No, New I stopped 87, something. February of 87. February of 87. So, so what happens? You decide to do comedy and you were already like, again, for the local area. And I think many people encounter this for their local area. They're the best at something, but now you're thrust into the real world where everybody in their local area was the best. What what surprised you when I started doing comedy? Yeah, because already you were you were the funniest person in school. Like everybody's the the ex of something in their sure, school. Sure, sure. You know the surprise, the weirdest part about doing stand up was when you hear when, when you're talking and you hear your voice projected back at you. That took a while. Like to what hear, does it mean? Like uh, hey, and I hear myself talking because in real life you're just talking like we are right now. I don't hear anything from this mic. I just hear James talking to me. But if there was a speaker in here hearing my voice projected in a room felt really odd. Like that was the weirdest part of my first set. And, and immediately knowing that I had no relationship with these people. Right, like, and, and that they're only <clears throat> there, you're not like talking about a topic, right? Like you're not talking about like, here's how I survived rehab. Like you're talking, you're, 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 your whole thing is you don't know each other, but there's this implicit contract that you're going to try to make them laugh. Yes, and it was a contest. It was at the Varsity Pub in Spotswood. And it was so weird to go up there and talk with no relationship. I didn't realize that you have to establish a relationship. You have to make them call. All these things that you learn as you go on, like with your friends, you're with your people. A lot of people think, they're, oh, I'm funny with my friends. Um, you know, it's like watching porn. Hey, I have sex with girls. I can do that. I'm funny with my friends. I can do that. But then you get on stage and you're like, oh, these aren't my friends. Do you right. ever see Fame, the movie Fame? Yeah, yeah. I learned a tremendous amount from Ralph Garcy in that movie because Ralph Garcy had all his friends there and he's like, uh, he's making them all laugh and they're his friends in the thing. But then he goes on and he's drunk and he goes on uh, with an audience that was not him and he bombed. I think that's like a, a, a classic thing. So, so about uh, a year ago, I rented out the Bell House in Brooklyn and I filled it up with my friends and I did six minutes of stand-up comedy. And of course, it was a friendly audience, sure. so everyone laughed the entire Rooting time. for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then I went this time, nobody knew who I was. I went to Stand Up New York where you do your UFC podcast, uh, yes. actually. Uh, and uh, uh, I only learned that the other day that you did a podcast there. And um, I go up and I was scared. And they're laughing at some jokes. They're not laughing at others. And I got to figure out how to like come back from that. And it's it was a different experience. Did you tape yourself? I did tape myself. Good. I haven't listened to it yet, but I'm going to listen to it. Get a I'm GoPro. Go again. It's easier to watch. I found that over the years, these little GoPros are amazing because it, listening to yourself is torture. Even after 27 torture. years, I hate it. But watching myself is just a little bit easier. It just feels like it's in the corner of the screen on the computer. I can work and peek at it while I'm doing something. It just feels more, less hard to focus when I can watch it. But understand that those things happen and bombing is it, it is it's great. It's what we learn from the most. And you watch yourself and you get uncomfortable. Take your, because you, you know, you're comfortable writing. Jot down what you did right and wrong or fix a joke and post. Like, oh, you know, I don't know. Oh, that's why that joke stunk. I tripped on the word. It was the no economy of words there. I said the funny line, then I said five words after it. That's what happened to me. The one joke that was dead silence, I, it's because I repeated the last line because I was unsure if they heard it. Yeah. And I, so I didn't, I, I, I didn't commit to the joke. Yeah. So, and in that moment, the best thing to do, if you can think of it, is to go, well, here's what just happened. I repeated the joke. Not only did you not laugh the first time, it bombed. Tw like, I, I like a lot of times acknowledging when I bomb um, because, but it has to be honest. Like, I don't want to bomb on purpose, but I've, I've happened to me. I, I bomb in this cellar. I'll have jokes bomb all the time. And if it's something that's a half laugh, maybe I'll keep going. But if it's death, a lot of times I'll stop and I'll say to the audience, that really bombed. And they laugh a lot of times because it's an acknowledgement of what they just saw. Right. So what, what I did was, I, that's a good idea. I'm going to try that to acknowledge why the joke failed, kind of like processes art sure. sort of thing. But what I did was I said, um, okay, now we, because it was sort of crude, the joke. I said, okay, now we know where the line is with this audience. And then they laughed, yeah. like you said. So it built up that uncomfortableness and it let them release it. Yes, by saying something, the honesty of just saying whatever it is. That's why people like hecklers because they like to, it's not that they want to see you ruin, ruined or the heckler. They want, it's alive and it feels in the moment. So it's really weird. Like 
I remember when I was touring with Dice, and I, you know, Dice changed my life. And Dice was the first guy who said, "Oh my God, this guy's talented," and he took you, he took you up. Yeah, I, I love Andrew Dice Clay. He really, he changed my life. I mean, he took me on the road. There was very little money, but it was an experience. He bought me my dinners. He flew me. We stayed in a great hotel. He showed me what a great life comedy can be. And I remember I was on stage with uh, him in Chicago. It was two nights in a row like 4,000 people a night, an extremely aggressive Chicago crowd. I never got booed off the stage with Dice, but a couple of times they were aggressive. And it taught me just to move very fast and, and to hit hard. What does it mean very fast? Like a certain number of laughs every five seconds? You just keep, immediately start hammering. I mean, I don't do that now because I'm more comfortable, but back then you had to survive those. Because mm -hmm. if you were like, uh, hey, ladies and gentlemen, uh, burr, like you weren't going to make it. Huh. So one night I'm on stage and Man Cow, who was a, a Chicago DJ, who was very popular at the time, uh, he brought me out. And I go on and they start booing. And, I, and, and they can't hear my opening line. I can't hear what I'm saying. They're booing. 4,000 people are booing me. And somebody heckled me and I said something. And then some of them stopped and somebody else heckled me. And the key is to repeat what someone says. Someone's like, get off the, sta get off the stage. And then all of a sudden there was a moment where they listened. Because there was that alive instinct where they wanted to hear, was I going to win or was I going to lose? So he said something and I hammered him and some of them laughed. How do you hammer? So you say you repeated what they said, then what'd you do? I just, I smashed him. I forget what, I don't even remember what the joke is. Um, I remember in either Houston or... Okay, I'll, I'll pretend I'm the hacker. Get off the stage, uh, you know, you suck. Let's get on Andrew Dice Clay. Um, well, in the moment it would have to, you might just say something nasty you might just go, I suck. All right, well, I may, uh, this is an old one too. I suck, but your father swallows. The crowd <laughs> will laugh at that. Something to that. It doesn't have to be that. It's a cadence thing. It's uh, um, I suck and then just say something mean about them or address them or address their girlfriend. Wh whatever you have to do, if you hit them with something kind of funny, the crowd laughed. Um, and then I knew I had a one joke buffer. Right. It was weird in that moment how your mind is moving a, f a thousand miles an hour. What do you mean by buffer? So you have you got you got uh, you bought yourself a few seconds. A couple of seconds, because the first one got a little bit of a laugh from the people that heard it. The second ha time, and again, I don't. Oh, I know what it was. This is Chicago. Uh, I started insulting Chicago, telling them they go fuck themselves, their city. Yeah, the, the, in, in either Houston or Dallas, the guy was yelling at me from the upper balcony, and I, I said about his father sucking my dick. Whatever. Um, you know, again, it was in 1997. And uh, this was in Chicago. I started attacking Chicago. Uh, Bill Burr did it in uh, Philadelphia on an Opie and Anthony show, and it became a viral thing. This was just a smaller thing. But I started attacking Chicago, and it got uh, some laughs. And then I knew, once I got a couple of laughs, I had a very quick buffer to do my joke. So I did the next joke, and it got a laugh. And then the next joke got a laugh. And then it picked up steam, and I did well. So it wasn't a killer set, but it actually turned out to be a nice 15-minute set compared to being booed off the stage. But it was the alive moment of them heckling and then these animals. It's like they're all yelling at me and then they volunteered to stop while I went after one of them. You know what I mean? Like once you start attacking back, then they wanted to hear what you said. But if you stood up there and just pretended it wasn't happening, you were dead. So so I feel like, so you do, you, you, Andrew Dice Clay kind of um, anointed you, yeah. brought you along, uh, and now... It seems like a lot of comedy or, or being a professional comedian is how how granular can you make your career? So you have radio shows, TV appearances, movie appearances, now, several of your own specials, now your own Netflix special, which came out this month. Uh, it seems like you can't just do the road. Correct. And some, and then there's still a luck thing. Like, like again, I'll bring up Louis C.K. again. Like, Lucky Louis, you were on every single episode of that and then here's Louis C.K. Uh, on the top of his game, but still the show gets canceled on HBO. And then his next pitch got canceled and FX almost didn't happen. That's right. So, and then Andrew Dice Clay, where, where is he? Like he's sort of, you know, Woody Allen brought him back to life for a short period, but he's sort of not in the same place you are right now. No, he's doing better. What Dice, Dice did, he did, he took a while now, and then he came back to Blue Jasmine with yeah, Woody. Yeah, gr great movie. He was amazing. And he's a great actor because he's unafraid. He was great in uh, Vinyl. He was on, in the opening uh, episode of Vinyl on HBO with Scorsese, and he oh, was great in that. that. He was fucking... Did you see the show? I saw the show, yeah. Dice was the guy who was like, uh, who tried to kiss Bobby Cannavale, who Bobby Cannavale beat over the head in his house. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was really funny. He improved a lot of lines. And now he's got a show on Showtime, which is really... Critics love it. Like, he has a show where he's kind of playing himself. 
Dice is a weird dude. Like, people think he's going to be like, oh, fuck the pussy, go! No. Off screen, all he wants to do is eat candy, and uh, he wants to be babied and mothered and like his little sugary treats, and he likes tea with honey. I used to tease him about what a fucking big baby he was, and the show kind of shows that, that silly side of him. So the show on Showtime is doing really well. He's on some cooking show, which everyone says he, him and his wife are really funny on. So he's had a bit of a resurgence. Uh, the Woody Allen... Uh, movie I think had a huge impact because that that gets a lot of people in the business right. focused. So he's doing very well now. But you do learn that you can't just do one thing. Like you never know what's gonna pop. Like for me, it's kind of just radio is fun. I love it. I get paid to talk to my dumb friends every day for three hours. It's fucking. I gotta, I You've interview. been doing it forever. You've been doing it since like two thousand one. Since about two thousand, I started. Then we got kicked off the air for a couple of years. And then I came back with Opie and Anthony in 2004, and then Anthony Cumia got fired in 2014. Me and Opie continued until last October. Now me and Sam are doing it. And uh, Opie is doing another show, and Ant is doing another show. You know, So it's weird how it works out. Um, but it was so much... It's fun to talk. It's fun to fucking do radio, and you ask people questions, and they have to answer them. Like That's then, the fun part. And then you do books... And I haven't in a while. Spots. I just started writing another book. I, I really want to write again. But in the time I took off from writing the books, the um, last one I did was 2008, which is like nine years ago. Um, I did four specials and I or three specials. Uh, yeah, four one hour specials. So I was like, I didn't do nothing. I was doing a bunch of Tonight Shows and I did specials. So it's like you always have to be doing something. Um, you can't just be lazy and not... But I talked to Chris Rock recently, and I, I know it sounds like I'm name dropping, but I'm not. And he's like, I'm That was a total name drop. Yeah, but, I didn't, but, but I didn't mean it like that because he's going on the road, and he said he hadn't been on the road in seven years for touring. And I'm like, what, seven years? Like, I didn't realize that he toured and then took off, but you see him all the time doing all this other shit. He's hosting the Oscars. He's doing this. Chris Rock's name is everywhere all and the time. And he tries out material at clubs. Like, he goes all to the Stress Factory in New Brunswick. Time. Yes, or the comedy cellar. He'll just walk on and do an hour. But I didn't realize that I hadn't heard about him touring for seven years. So like all of a sudden someone doesn't tour, but because they're doing other things, you're always hearing their name. And I feel, I feel again, that's important. People, people sort of talk about, oh, you have to focus on one thing. But everything that you could be interested in usually has an umbrella of activities. So, so you've done all of these different activities under the umbrella of comedy. And that together is what makes you successful. And again, uh, I just I keep bringing up Louis C.K. and That's I, fine. I, he's, I a good, he's a good reference that. point. No, no, I love but, him. But he, you know, he was offered that job of head writer of Conan back in the early '90s. He didn't take it to to go on the road and to to make movies and to write for other TV shows and then to do his own shows and to produce other shows. Like he's done all these different things, just like you have. It seems like that's important for success. Yeah, Louis is a weird guy in that he's not a like. I don't know if he's afraid, but he acts as if he's not. And, and and meaning his his actions are, are not he, he's got he's probably the most practical guy I've ever known in the business, um, you know I interviewed him once for this like comedy interview show I was doing we talked about Pootie Tang, and listening to him great movie critically destroyed not acclaimed destroyed <laughs> it's amazing people forget Louis was murdered for Lucky Louis he got murdered by critics. He was murdered for Pootie Tang. Like, so this guy, who they all now know as a comic genius, was always funny, but back then he was shit to the critics. Not even not great, right. shit. And, and now, which is an amazing, it's the most amazing probably rebirth of all time. But they just finally saw, oh, okay, he did a project that they finally resonated with them and they got. But he's amazing because he rebounded from those those really, uh, he told me he had like very little money because he went through a divorce after Lucky Louie. So he's a very, when you watch a guy who's so practical in his approach and he's so good at analyzing what went wrong and not being a bitch about it, he's not at all a bitch about stuff like that. You know, Louis like, he's almost psychotic in his inability to be affected by it. He's like, well, you do this and then you do that. Like, he just understands so the like, connecting. So, like, when Loki Louie got canceled and he have, obviously had to call you up and say, look, Jim, I'm sorry, we're not coming back for another season. He, you didn't you didn't think he was like destroyed by it? No, I remember us walking on Broadway. He had done the radio show. And we were still waiting to hear, and he was going, you know, and and this uh, this is how it happens. A lot of times you don't find out till the last minute. But he would analyze how we had done with lit with viewers, and he said the positive thing about Lucky Louie was that like we shot all the episodes before any of them were aired. So nobody knew who I was or Louis or any of the, in the audience. None of them knew Louis C.K. They didn't know me. They didn't know Pan Adlon. They didn't know fucking Rick Chappelle. Uh, What's-her-name did uh, 
Uh, oh my God. Uh, Jesus Christ. She was just in La La Land. Um, Emma Stone? Emma Stone. Yeah, she was she, in Lucky Louie? She did an episode. Yeah, huh. she, I was in a scene with Emma Stone. It's so funny. She was very sweet. She was 16. She played the one who offered to blow Louie. Huh. She was like the daughter, the teenage daughter of, her, uh, of the friend. Nobody knew who any of us were back then. Laura Keitlinger. And then, um, so we'd come out to this cold audience. And a lot of them were just like, like, like rehab people that were shipped in. Rick Shapiro. And we got big laughs. The show got big laughs. And then Louis said when it aired, every week it would go up. He said, normally a show airs and then it starts to dip. He said, you know how I knew Lucky Louie was doing well? Because I never really had black fans, but black people love that show as well. And I would have black guys yelling out the car, Lucky Louie, like cabs. I was like, people are really watching this show. Um, and then HBO, because they, I think it was a judgment error by them. They've made very few judgment errors. Let's stop to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Are you hiring? Posting your job in one place isn't enough to find quality candidates. If you want to find the perfect hire, you need to post your job on all of the top job sites. Trust me about this. I have been through so many cycles of hiring and all the different generations of job websites. You can't just post on one. You won't get the right candidate. But now, finally, you can. ZipRecruiter already has 9 million resumes you can search through in their database. You can add multiple people to your account to make it the most efficient for your team to find the best hire. With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post your job to 100 or more job sites, including social media networks like Facebook and Twitter, all with a single click. ZipRecruiter's handy website shows trending career fields, cities, and searches, which is a really good to see the kinds of things people are hiring for just in case you need to start early. Find candidates in any city or industry nationwide. Just post once and watch your qualified candidates roll in to ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use interface. Quickly screen candidates, rate them, and hire the right person fast. So find out today why ZipRecruiter has been featured on Forbes and why it's been used by over 1 million businesses. Right now, you guys and gals can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free by going to ZipRecruiter.com slash James. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash James. You get it for free. One more time. Try it for free. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash James. Ugh, if you're a small business owner, I feel for you. It is really hard, but freaking out and burying your head in the sand will not solve your problems come tax time. By the way, freaking out and burying your head in the sand will never solve any of your entrepreneurial problems. That's just a, a rule. But what will help you with paperwork and tax stuff and so on is bringing FreshBooks into your world. FreshBooks is the ridiculously easy to use cloud accounting software that's made for people like you and me who can't stand doing their taxes. Seriously, it will transform the way you handle your taxes because FreshBooks keeps all of your cash flow details in one place so you know exactly what invoices you sent, who's paid you, and what your income is. And their mobile app allows you to take pictures of your receipts and organize them for later, which makes claiming expenses a total breeze. This is my Achilles heel is keeping track of all those receipts. So FreshBooks lets you do it with their mobile app. You can even set up FreshBooks to import expenses directly from your bank accounts. So for a 30-day free trial, just go to freshbooks.com forward slash James because they love this podcast so much and enter the code James in the how did you hear about us section. That's freshbooks.com forward slash James and enter the code James in the how did you hear about us section. Yeah, particularly on the comedy side, like I think wasn't Chris Albrecht there then, or was it right? Uh, yeah, it was Chris right Albrecht. Chris Albrecht was there. Yeah, Chris Albrecht was there. Carolyn Strauss was there. So they're, they're comedy people. Yeah, and and on this one, I just think it was a mistake because I had to audition for them in the room. I mean, that's Chris and Carolyn were in the room when I, when I went in, and um, they were very supportive. Carolyn, by the way, who I will, I love both of them because they gave me a shot, and I love Louis for giving me that shot. But Carolyn, especially because every week in rehearsal, just to off track a little bit, you'd go through, the first we started shooting, luckily we'd shoot on a Thursday and then shoot another episode on the Friday with some rewrites. Then we started shooting two episodes on Friday instead. So every week, Wednesday, we'd go through a, a read, a cast read, and then a live rehearsal with just HBO's people. And they'd walk through and I would bomb every fucking week. I thought I was gonna get fired. Me and Laura, the two dumb comedians, like we're getting fired. I stink. 
I would I would never get laughs. I'm like, this sucks. Were you scripted or did you improv? Scripted. Scripted. I was but- bombing my fucking head off from the from the HBO people. And Louis told me one time, because I was only contracted to be in three or four. But yeah, I wound up a little piece in every one, a little piece yeah. in every one. And Louis told You're me. You're in all of them. I, I wound up being in all of them. Louis said to me, it's because of Carolyn. He said, Carolyn, sometimes her main note would be, I want more Norton. Mm. She loved me. Carolyn Strauss loved me. So I'll always love Carolyn. She was, she's one of the executive producers on Game of Thrones. Because I, I, think, I think also you, you were one of the key pieces that, that changed the format. Like he, he basically took this 1970s format, like it was like all in the family, but twisted. Yeah. And you were like the, the weird twisted neighbor selling, you know, pot to high school students or whatever. It wasn't like the classic, like just goofy neighbor. You were, you were twisted. Yeah. And so was Rick Shapiro as uh, Uncle Jerry. Or was it the cousin Jerry? Rick Shapiro was really great in that uh, as Pam's brother. Uh, there was some very, you might even walked in naked. I mean, uh, that's the biggest laugh I've ever seen anything get in a room. Rick Shapiro, the laughs were so big on Lucky Louie. And, I, and I'm not, I'm bragging about it, but I'm also saying this is where the critics go wrong. One guy in the San Francisco Chronicle, I actually wrote to this guy because he was saying the laughs are too big. It's too loud. It's obno- like, it's like they're so used to sitcom laughs being evened out. Not one laugh was sweetened. Louis wouldn't allow it. Louis would tell the audience before every episode. He'd walk out and he'd go, okay, you know, that practical fucking Louis way with his arms kind of half out. If you like it, laugh. If you don't, don't. We don't want you faking it. Have fun. He would go out and just break the wall and tell people, laugh if you think it's funny, and that's it. Would you rewrite and reshoot if people didn't laugh a scene that you thought would get laughs? Yes, uh, because again, that's where your comedian instinct comes in because you're talking to an audience and you feel self-conscious doing the same joke in front of the same audience. So a lot of times you have to reshoot a scene. You blow a line or something wouldn't work, and Louis would go, what do you got? You got anything? And we would try a second joke. Or I would ask him, and he would go, uh, nah, let's just do it again the way we had it. Okay, we would do it the way we had it. You know, Sometimes you have to because the joke is so good. But uh, I re- he was such a. I remember one time there was a girl in rehearsal. We were doing some scene with a waitress, and uh, the woman playing the waitress had a, a, a you know those clear plastic things that are on a shirt that have M M M M M for medium. It's like when you buy a shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It will have a clear strip on it with a bunch of M's that lets you yeah. know it's a medium. And they didn't wardrobe didn't realize that this new sticker was still on. I remember Louis saying to me, "All I want." is for that to make it on the show. I just want them to not notice that she's wearing that fucking new tag. He wanted that mistake. And of course they noticed it and it didn't make it on the show. But he liked imperfection. Louis likes mistakes and things that don't look 100% right. Like he told me he almost fired wardrobe because they were trying to make Pam Adlon too hot. And she's a very cute girl. Yeah. But he wanted her to look a little plainer and a little regular, just like a regular wife it's in so a regular important situation. Because the fact that she looks regular combined with her abrasiveness yeah actually makes her a real person yeah louie with her fucking hair but she's hot but he didn't want her all sexed up he didn't want that at all none of us were great looking except for pam she was by far the hottest one and laura keitlinger is good looking too but like you know jerry minor myself rick i mean what we fucking we're not that great looking i mean you know louie's a five so it's like (laughs) (laughs) that was the best part you know mike Haggerty, who i haven't seen since then and then after that show so so he so wait so how did you find out it was canceled? Because you know, that was your biggest thing up to that point, without I mean, a doubt. Yeah, without a doubt, it's still one of my favorite things I did. Um, Tough crowd was one of my favorite things too. I found out Louis was canceled. I think by process, lucky Louis, not Louis. I apologize. Yes, lucky right. Louis was canceled just by the process of it not getting picked up. I think Louis finally goes, yeah, they're not going to do it. But by that point, you know, a lot of times they just don't say anything. Like they kind of let it go and they let it go. And then all of a sudden it's such a minuscule, it's like watching, you ever hear in Pink Floyd when they go uh, in, um, in in Comfortably Numb, like a distant ship smoke on the horizon. That's what the show begins to look like. Uh, uh. It's like a pfft. So you kind of just it's, know. It's, you just know. Like it's every, like Game of Thrones, there's all this excitement around, or whatever was was on back then, or Sopranos, there's all this excitement around, and you, there was no excitement around Lucky Louie, and so you just know this is going to drift away. We knew it was going to drift away because the, 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 the ratings were high, but the critics didn't like it, and the critics sunk it. And because HBO is very, very much based on awards and critics, because and, I, and I, th- their formula works. Uh, but I remember Louis saying to me in, in season one, he goes, I, for season two, want to write an episode with you, uh, with Don Rickles as your father, playing a cop. He wanted Rickles to play a cop 
and be my dad. And he had a scene written for it. He had a bunch of stuff. He goes, that will be so funny. But then it just obviously didn't happen. Oh my God. And that would be, particularly given when we're airing this, I mean, Rickles died <clears throat> yesterday, right? In real life, he died yesterday. But by the time you're hearing this, it might be a couple of weeks, whatever. I mean, yeah. it's still, uh, but I was just, it reminded me of that moment. You know, there's a lot of things we wanted to do. But again, look, we got a full season on HBO. I'm, and I'm and lucky. it got you seen because then, like then, then Louis his his next specials like were out of control. They were so great, and then of course he got Louis, which you, yeah. which you're on re pretty regularly. Yeah, I was in the the uh, I think the first episode. There's a very very good scene with myself, and I think Hannibal was in the scene, and a gay comic named Rick uh, Chrome. Is this the poker scene? But, well, there's a few of them we did, but this was about the word faggot. And uh, Nick DiPaolo, who's so good. And Nick is such a funny comic and such a good actor. Where I think, Nick, come on, you faggot, or whatever. But then Rick goes, do you know where that word comes from? I forget how it went. That was in the poker scene. That was in the poker scene. And it was this intense scene. And I remember doing, and where that came from was a real conversation at the Comedy Cellar, which I remember the conversation. Rick was just saying it. Um, not scolding anybody. He was like, yeah, well, the word faggot comes from blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and then Louis wrote that into his scene, and it worked. Um, but I had poker scenes there in three or four there was one really funny one on Louis we shot, which never aired, which broke my heart. It was because it was Nick DiPaolo, myself, I think, oh, Sarah Silverman was in this one. And the poker scene aired. But at the end of it, again, Louis is just so weird that he likes this. He had a chimp. Um, he brought a chimp in. A guy walks in with a, a baby chimp. And then Nick DiPaolo is supposed to jump up. What the fuck? I fucking hate those things and scream at it. But because you can't scream at a chimp, because they will react violently. Uh. They had to shoot it a different way, and it just didn't work. And I think the guy handling the chimp was having a hard time with the ch doing his lines, so it just didn't work. So Louis had to cut the entire chimp part out. That really bugged me, and I know it bugged him because he wanted to air that. But there's there's footage of a of Nick DiPaolo <laughs> screaming uh, about a chimp being in the room that I really wish would have aired. It was, at the end, that's how the poker scene ended. Um, it's just so weird, and I wish that one would have made it. And look, that show obviously is one of the greatest shows on television right now. And you have a, a I, I, what do you call it? It's not like a regular recurring role, but you're on it all the time. I've had a decent amount of scenes. Louis has written me into every year. Uh, it's off now. It's done. But I mean, uh, it's done forever. I didn't. I even believe know that. so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's finished. And uh, why, he, why would he finish that? Like it's so great. Because he, he could bring it back if he wants to. Yeah. It didn't end like by for any reason other than the fact that I think Louis wants to do specials and all this stuff, he may bring it back. I mean, yeah. he's never said to me it's over. I'm just assuming because I haven't heard of Louis being over. But if he wants to do it, he can do it. Um, you know, whatever he wants to do. He's got carte blanche now pretty much right. in Hollywood. So I think he just got sick of it. He was a success at it. And it went away. What about uh, you doing uh, sitcom now? Like, what about you just... Like, it seems like that was such a pivotal moment for him where he got sure. over the top. And now, like you said, you're doing... You know this radio stuff, and we, we were talking a little bit before we started. You're 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 in all these things that are not quite kind of putting you over the top. Not on that level, no. It's hard, but it's really weird. Like you know, you don't. You, I I always feel like oh, I am one step away from being out of the business. I never feel like I'm doing well, and I see friends of mine who I've known for a while, and I'm like guys who are doing a gig once a week. We don't have any, and I'm like, ooh, that's what it's like to not be in the, you know, because my friends are Amy or Louis or Kevin Hart. I know for 15 years, like when you when you when you when you have friends, Bill Burr, who are doing arenas, then you feel like I'm out of the business. But it's like, no, I'm actually doing really well in the business compared to the superstars of it. I'm doing okay. But you're always going to compare yourself to the to better the people, right? Sure. Above you. I never feel better than other people. I always want to achieve what I'm not achieving. So will I get something? I mean, look, of course you always can. I mean, I'm 48. I mean, Rodney didn't get gigantic fame until I think he was in his late 40s, early 50s. I've had a good career so far. And you know, this net, like, I don't know if you can say, but what's the economics of a Netflix special? I mean, I know it's different per per person, but like, what's the average economics? Yeah, what, they, the money for it? Yeah, because and my my understanding is it's like just a math equation for them. They they put up a show, they figure out how many subscribers they're going to get for it, and you know they cut that in half, and that's what they pay you. They don't pay me like that. I you know guys like Chris Rock, I probably got around three hundred thousand for my special. Which is nice money for you know uh, a bit of work. I mean, nuts. I'm doing what I love. I, it was in that area. It was more than I made for HBO. I think I made 150 thousand for HBO, a lot less for the epic specials, uh, which was okay. I was happy to do it. You make your money up on the road. Guys like Chris Rock get 20 million for two specials. Chappelle, million, you know. But again, 
Netflix is looking at them as we have these gigantic Louis, we have Chris Rock, we have Seinfeld. Those guys, um, I'm happy to have gotten what I got. I mean, plus whatever it cost them to produce this special. So I was relatively inexpensive compared to those guys. And the response for it has been really good. Like, I mean, better than anything I've ever done in my career, people have responded to this. And I'm very grateful for it. So I'm hoping it will get me another one. You know, I'm so, hoping. So, so and, and I wanted to kind of get into this because, so I've watched all your specials and I feel like <laughs> this is the, mo this one, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, this one you wrote the most. Like in the sense of you wrote, you took your personal experiences and you figured out the most how not to just be funny, but how to kind of twist them into jokes. You know, I don't know. It, this one was the least about current issues. Like normally, um, this one felt like the most personal. Like Monster Rain, I admitted some stuff, but I talked a lot more about the, this one was the most about me. Um, this but not a, just a conversation, like you had punchlines. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this one was like, you know, the other ones were, were more about, I guess, you know, there was some about me. Like I said, I always like kind of la the launching pad is my own wretchedness, but it was about other stuff. Uh, this one was probably the funniest. I think this one of all of them was the funniest. Uh, it got the best laughs. It felt the most relaxed on stage. The most, but it's like anything else. P people said when I did uh, Contextually Inadequate, a lot of the fans said, this is the best one you've done. Like compared to the other ones, you look more comfortable. You have a better performer, you've, which I believe they were correct. And then this what happened, and they go, dude, this is by far the best one. And that's what you want. Like as a comedian or as any performer, the fact that people are like, man, the, the other one was okay. This one was your best. And then you do another one, like, no, dude, this one. It makes you feel so good. Like I'm, I, you, you always want to progress. Like you want to keep getting funnier and keep getting better. But I, honestly, James, this one, I don't know if I wrote the most for... Um, this one felt even more relaxed and comfortable. Maybe I'm just better than I was. Like well, you just feel better. I think. I think. And 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 again, we're starting this off from a foundation where I knew you as always being an order of magnitude funnier than the average human being. So we're we're, we're starting off with a foundation that you had this natural talent and quick wit and so on. So when I say wrote the most versus others, you were funny in in all of them. This one felt more like maybe you weren't asking the audience for laughs. So like you kind of were more confident in yourself to, to, to begin and end a joke and go into the next one. And that's why I wondered if it was more written or not. That's a good point. And, and you know, maybe I think the not asking them for laughs in a way is more because of what I was talking about. Like when you're talking about, there was nothing for me to convince them of in this one. Like a lot of times if you talk about Donald Sterling, like I defended Donald Sterling, even though I think he's a douchebag. I defended the Duck Dynasty guys, even though I think they're douchebags. I defended Mel Gibson. I defended Anthony Cumia, one of my closest friends. You know, in a lot of moments where you're defending something, you're building a case and then being funny or trying to be funny while you build the case. There really was no case to build here. So this would, maybe that's why it felt that way. Yeah, because maybe you felt also, maybe you have a confidence now that people at least know who you are because of the because of the Opie and Jim, because of your, your well, show Opie and Sam. Anthony even more than Opie and Jim. Opie and Anthony was the big one. Opie and Jim, he and I both tried. At times it works, at times it didn't. And, uh, and, and, just, and you've been on Louie a lot. You've been on Inside yeah. Amy Schumer a lot. So maybe you have this sense now people are there because they know who you are. Mm -hmm. And so so now it's more that friendly audience thing again. Yeah, and I and I felt with this one, the only thing in this one, the only mild case I wanted to make was when I talked about transgender girls was was that uh Hollywood is in a way full of shit because their their support is fake. Uh it means well, I don't think that they're all frauds, but I think their support because they say well they say something, but they don't personalize it at all. They have that scolding. I, I think I did, that was the only case I wanted to make. Like, this is what support is. It's admitting this is who you are. It's not saying you support people by using the right hyphen. You know, that to me is just not enough. So that was kind of the only case I wanted to build, and it was a very brief one. So maybe that's why I felt this way. But that's but, a good point you made. But but it, but it's, it intersects also kind of your own kind of personal and sexual sure. interests and so on. So like, you made the, the point about... Um, they canceled um, Caitlyn Jenner's reality show. That was in this this special, sure. right? and uh, y it was funny. Like you basically say, uh, you know, she it's, it was the guy, the Olympic guy in the Wheaties box, just just murdered someone while texting in a car accident. Uh, uh, you know, 
change gender and they still cancel the show. Like it's not interesting enough. So what, 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 what is it in Hollywood now? Like what can actually uh, be higher than the bar in Hollywood? Well, I don't think she was texting and driving. You should say this so you don't get sued. I think, I think that she was just driving. I don't think she was texting and driving. Okay. Yeah. You have to All right. See. All right. Yeah. We'll block that out. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know if her show worked. I don't, I don't, I've seen like a moment of it here and there, but it was more like the network going, Hey, we don't do that. And I'm like, well, you can't, it's just funny how they look at things. And I, I, I don't know. Like they, they, they all say the right thing. They all say the right thing. But every time one, someone gets caught with a trans girl, it's a scandal. Why? Like, why is it a scandal? I don't know if Tiger did or not, but who gives a shit? Yeah. Who gives a fuck? I don't care. They say Keanu Reeves might be dead. Who cares? Yeah. Who gives a shit? Like, why is that scandalous? It's just, he's just dating this person. So, so, you know, this is a, this is a, a, a tricky question because whenever I talk to somebody who's, good at what they do from like almost birth, they have a hard time articulating why it is they're good. So, uh, you know, I've interviewed uh, Tony Hawk, the skateboarder. Sure. He's, he's basically been like world champion status since he was nine years old. Yes. Just interviewed Gary Kasparov, the former world champion. Where the fuck champion. did you meet Gary Kasparov? Yeah, just, uh, he, he, he has a new book coming out, so he agreed to come on my podcast. I actually played him a game just the other day. Oh my I God. Lost, but, you know. Gary Kasparov, I'm so jealous. I'm really jealous. I would love to meet him. It, it was great. He lives on the Upper West Side of New York here. Okay, then so, I want, when does well, this book come out? Uh, May, early May. Uh, what are we He'll do next? some book signing or something. Wait, oh, it comes out in May. Yeah, I'll I'll fight to get him on the show. That guy, that's yeah, you've got to get him on the show. I'll introduce his uh, publisher. Please to you. do, yeah, because I'm a huge chess fan. Now, when you're playing Kasparov, uh, you obviously know he's going to win. But how much fun is it just to watch him do it, it? It was amazingly fun, and it was amazingly interesting to think about it afterwards. Everything he did to to win. <laughs> Like he still is trying his hardest to beat me, who's obviously going to lose, and I'm a strong player for myself. It's like again in high, you know, in my local area, I was the best around, but sure. of course, then he's like the Louis C.K. of of chess or whatever. Sure. And um, I played a, a, a variation I've been playing since I was 18 years old, so 30 30 years, and he mixed it up just a little bit to throw me off. He got me playing two different openings simultaneously, and he's like, "Ah, oh, you made weaknesses." He and, said that, yeah. He <clears> said, <throat> and 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 it was like he, he just ran me over. I had no play at all. It's amazing, right? Yeah, it was amazing because suddenly I looked at the position. There was nothing I could do. I was just I had to wait until I lost. And but but this is the question. He had a hard time articulating why he was the best. So what I'm going to ask you is, when you're as someone who now I want to get. Not because I want a career at stand-up comedy. I just want to overcome this fear and get good, at, get good at something I enjoy watching. I want to do. So, how does one go about constructing a joke? And now, not just a joke, but you take it from your life. Like the best comedians take it from their lives. You know, some people have asked me, "How do you?" Sometimes you just see it. Like I've, I've, I've tried to talk, like on the radio. <clears throat> if you're talking about something and you, it's moving very quickly, when comedians are making fun of each other, boom, boom, boom. You just like someone says something, and it, it's it's a weird thing. It's like it's floating in front of you. Like there's all these options. You're not thinking of it like that, but you just know. Um, like say my co-host, we're talking. Like you know, um, you know, I uh, you know what I ought to do? I, I ought to go to the store. When he goes, you know what I ought to do? Immediately, my mind is thinking: shoot yourself, hang yourself, uh, suck a dick, uh, uh, meanness, always mean, always or always the opposite of what I think is good because that's not going to be funny. You know what I should do? Uh, yes, eat a sandwich. Boo! So it's immediately when he goes. You know what I should do? He asks the question. I try to pick. It is hard to explain. Like the most opposite of what I think he's about, about to say. Like, what's um, an example? Like something like that. Like when he's when they're asking a question in mid sentence. Um, you know, um, you know what's really hard, and then automatically, okay, that's a question. I know he's going somewhere, but there's that moment that he's leaving, that half a second split, and you just see these thoughts in front of you. What's what's really hard? Uh, a dick. About it doesn't have to be dirty. It can be any whatever your mind tells you in that moment, and you, it's hard to recreate it until it's happening. But then you see it happening, and you just you fire out the line. It may work. It may not work. Okay, so let me ask you on that though. Your your first instinct there was to say, "What well, you know? What's hard? A dick." Uh, it's is which that, is childish, sure. Right, it's childish, but again, your your humor goes into your own sexual, you know, perversions as you call them, and so on. And is that 
the easy way out? Like, is it harder to be a Seinfeld or a Gaffigan that's totally clean and never uh, goes into the sexual stuff? No, because I think, th th because that's who they are. Like, I know Jim for 20 years. That's who he is. He was always been a little quirky. Hello, he's this weird character. Jim's never really been, he used to curse. Um, it might limit you a little bit, uh, when you're when you're when you're doing what they do, but I also know that as good as those guys are, neither of them could look an audience in the face and tell an audience about themselves what I'll tell an audience about myself. That and be, you know what I mean, like neither of them could. And I'm not, and they're both brilliant comedians, right. but their style is different than mine. I also couldn't make banal observations so interesting. Seinfeld can do that. I can't get the type of laughs with just family observations that Jim Gaffigan can get. Do you know what I mean? And will that will that limit you career-wise sure. in some way? In a way it does, yeah. But in a way, people who are fans of mine feel like they, they're close to me and they know me. Like they, 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 there's a, I get a tremendous amount of email from people who are like, thanks for saying that because I felt I was weird. And I, th and I love, it makes me feel good. Like Jim is true to Jim and Jerry's true to Jerry. So those guys are certainly doing something amazing. But I don't think there's any, I've said that the term I've used before is there's no valor in being clean and there's no valor in being dirty. Um, there's plenty of clean comics that stink. Like Birbigli is a clean comic. He's very funny. Tom Papa is a very funny clean comic. He slays. You know, these guys fucking hammer like a dirty comic will hammer. So you can be really good clean or dirty. Um, if I was just doing fart jokes, like I don't do fart. Like, you know what I mean? Like I was up there and I cut a, fart and I waved it where you know but a hey, clean comedians can just do McDonald's jokes too and be despicable you know what I mean or you ever notice on a plane the peanuts the small thing a peanut in the pile gets on oh ladies and gentlemen I'm like oh God. you could be a hack and be totally clean so I, I think it's all what you're really saying or what you're exposing um you know but I do admire those guys a lot they're just very different but look so at Louis he's filthy yeah, Louis's filthy. He goes back and forth. Yeah, he can do both, but he's a yeah. dirty comedian. And 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 uh, the show. I'll, I'll ask you about the show because you're so involved in it. The show is not really a comedy. I mean, there's funny moments, but there are some moments that are like depressing and dark, like the scene where Parker Posey dies. Uh, Did she die? I didn't see it. Oh yeah, I love like, Parker Posey. Yeah, you know, and she was great on the show. And then he, uh, I won't give it away. Then, but uh, that's okay. But uh, 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 it's like the final scene of one of the seasons uh, where she like just dies in the hospital, and it's like this depressing scene. But uh, uh, so you could kind of be he mixes that dark with that humor in yeah. a very good way. Um, but do you do you, when you're preparing a special or when you're preparing like to go out on the road? Do you sit at home and like take out a pad and like think, oh, this is what's annoying me today, and I'm gonna write a joke about it? Or no, just I go on stage at the comedy show and try. I just give it a shot and see what works. Plus, the radio show kind of keeps your mind working because you're talking for three hours, so your mind is kind of like. You know, so you get going. a sense on the show what somebody's laughing at, and then you'll try that. You'll work on it and try that same thing on on the stage. Maybe, maybe not. Sometimes it will just go, oh yeah, I do want to talk about this. And then you're not sure where you're going to go with it. Um, but see, that's where I think you're, this is where I think it's hard to articulate because I think you were always, always had the wit. So if someone is trying, doesn't quite come from your foundational point where you, your baseline where you started, they have to think about the joke. You could sort of say, okay, I'm going to take a topic that seems weird to me and I'm going to have the wit to construct it into a joke. And explore it. Yeah, and, and a lot of times, you learn a lot of times where the laughs can be and where to put them. Um, sometimes they're just not there. You know, a lot of times I try jokes that, are, like I said, the joke is just, it's not there. But there's really, it's hard to say because there's really no formula to it. Like, you know, uh, like I'm, I'm working on a new hour now. So I, I worked it out at the Fat Black Pussycat twice this week. And, uh, you know, it sucks. I want to go on the road. And I can't do the Netflix stuff, so it's got to be a new hour of material. And it's working pretty well. Uh, the first night was great. The second night was good because I was too in my head about the order, trying to remember, did this go here, did that go? You know, there was too much business in my head and not just being free on stage. But, I mean, you have to get it down. You have to say it in an order. You can't just walk up there and say nothing. You have to, it won't make sense. Uh, so being free like that is really fun when there's how, no pressure. How can you go on the road if you're doing all the radio stuff and the podcast stuff and everything? I build it around it. Like a lot of times I'll just miss Friday's show or I'll go do Friday. It's in my contract. I'm allowed to do X amount of, uh, I very, very rarely take days off. I don't take sick days almost ever. Uh, I take days off just to tour. Um, I make more money doing stand-up than I do radio usually. If, I'm, if it's a full, this year I won't because I'm not doing as much stand-up. I mean, I have not been on the road yet and it's three months in. 
Um, what's the what's the uh, when you go on the road? Where you go to major cities? What's the biggest you filled up? It's hard to say, man. I'll go to uh, I'll go to Chicago. I'll go to Boston. I'll go to for me. 1,500 seats, maybe 2,000 on the max, sometimes 1,000, 800. I don't go crazy. I can't. I can't sell that many tickets. Um, and for me, a, a great audience is between 1,000 and 1,500 people is perfect. Perfect. Um, there's, I haven't had a pop where I can do 6,000 people. I just wouldn't be able to do it. Um, I've done it in groups with other people, but that to me, about 1,000 is very comfortable. This is where I feel like uh, and I don't know how many times you've pitched shows, but I feel like you gotta, or is is media even going in this direction? Like, is there an ability now to have a TV show and have it be noticed like a like a Louis, which started you know many years ago? I feel like it's harder for TV shows to get noticed just because there's so many. There's so many, but by the same token, there's so many places to do them. So you'll turn on TV and see reality show stars. You're like, I've never seen this show, and this guy's had a reality show on for four years. So you can still be relatively obscure and have a TV show. Louis won Emmys. So if you're winning a lot of Emmys, the business takes notice, the public takes notice because your name is everywhere because they're writing about you. So, you know, you can have a... But if Louis, say, won no awards for that show, he wouldn't be as famous because people wouldn't have just... Oh, it's just a really funny show on FX. But the awards help a lot. Yeah, and ditto for Inside Amy Schumer's won Emmys. She has won Emmys, yeah. Plus Amy... You know, she was she's a woman saying a lot of things, and you know, she had a lot of controversy. Some love her, some hate her guts. Um, you know, she just popped up through the stratosphere, and importantly for her, her films did well. Trainwreck made a hundred million dollars, and you know, people say, "Well, Dane Cook." What happened with Dane Cook is he was doing arenas, but then he did a couple of movies, and they didn't make that kind of money. So that makes it harder for you. You know what I mean? Like the movies, a lot of times will propel you further and open you up to a whole new audience so you can keep that arena business going. It's harder if you don't have movies that are knocking you into the next level. So so what happens? Like you always, you constantly have to, like no one's taking care of you. It's not like you work in a corporation and there's this myth that, okay, eventually I'm going to get promoted, I'm going to sure. get promoted again, and then I'm going to retire. Like you constantly have to be the one pushing yourself to do the different, to try your career in different directions. Like do you ever think, okay, um, I'm 48 now, I'm going to be, then I'm going to be 50, then 60, then 70. What's going to happen to me then? Do you ever get like scared? No, I do think of it. But I mean, for stand up, I'll always be able to go out and make enough to pay my rent. You know, I mean, as long as I'm not paralyzed, I mean, I'll always be able to go out and make a living um, doing gigs. Uh, you know, I may have to downsize someday, but I save my money. I'm pretty smart. I have a mortgage, I pay my bills. So hopefully I can own my apartment in 10 years. I would like to own, I own my first one, I rolled it into this one. Um, that's a good thing because then they can never take your apartment from you and you can always sell it if you have to. And so, do you see comedians it. who like oh. starred with you who are just like, you do you think to yourself, what the hell are these guys going to do 10 years from now? Yeah, I see a lot of guys that didn't make smart financial decisions or they're not uh, furthering themselves, they're not writing or they're out of the business or they have day jobs. And, you know, And again, maybe some of them are happy doing that. But... I like a lot of the, I've made some bad decisions, but I've made a lot of good ones too. You know, I just, I'm, I'm, I don't, I mean, you know finance better than anybody. I don't take for granted that I'm always going to have money. So I invest. I'm fairly conservative with that shit just so I have it there and I pay my bills and I pay into my principal to try to knock them. And, you know, I want to be responsible. I make money. So while you're making it, like when the stock market crashed a few years ago, I didn't lose that much money because I had been paying into my fucking principal. You know, I mean, I'm not reckless. I mean, I probably spend too much on pornography and, Massages, but hey, we all have our thing. We all have our thing. So, Gary so, Kasparov, I'm so jealous. I know. I was, uh, that was really like, the, well, this and that are like the highlights of my week. Oh, I have come to on. Say. <laughs> that was Monday. This is Friday. Oh, that so, was Monday. He was here. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 okay. Three tips for me. I want to be, you know, again, I think I'm like average funny. Like when I'm giving a talk, I always get people to laugh, but I'm not like stand up funny. So, what's if I want to do this, what are the three things I should do or read or watch or learn? Write material every day. I like, wrote for I don't even years. know how to write material. Like, write what? down any thought you think might be funny, hmm. whether it is or not. Put it down. Make it, make it real by putting it down. Don't leave it in smoke, in okay. the atmosphere. Put it down and look at it. Um, tape every set you do and make yourself watch it or listen to it, whatever it is. Yeah. I did that for a long time. And I would suggest get on stage every night. Those are the three most important things. Write things down you think are funny. Get on stage every night. Tape yourself and watch it. 
because the ability getting on stage every night's hard. It is hard, or as much as humanly possible. Yeah. Where you know in your heart you're really trying, not where you're showing up and going, ah, there's a line, I'm going home, but where you know you're really trying. Because there's a million people who want to do it. There's a lot of funny people. The difference between me and some other people is the fact that I just showed up. I was willing to show up. You know, that whole uh, that whole getting De Niro to spank me in the opening of my special only happened because I was willing to do a, a very, very brief one-line scene in the movie The Comedian that wound up beyond my... I mean, I had asked for three years ago for him to do the special. He wrote his people and he's busy. And I didn't know him. And it just kind of it, it spun into this thing where I got to know him a little bit. And then when I asked him, he did it. Like, it, it's all just showing up. I showed up for that little scene in The Comedian. I was willing to be helpful to it and... and and then the the director liked me and asked me to do the blah, 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 and then it just moves a little bit. But I, I think was, that, that that's an important point because the opening of of your Netflix special Mouthful of Shame, that's a scripted opening more or less where you have Ricky Gervais, uh, I don't know if I said it Gervais, right. yeah, Gervais, uh, Louis C.K. and Robert De Niro in that opening scene, sure, and it's hilarious. And it's not because you just suddenly asked them today; it's because of the time you put in, the seeds you've planted in the industry, where you get, like you said, you you get to know Robert De Niro a little, and then he returns the favor in some small way years later in a way that's unexpected. Yeah, because he liked me, and he, and he liked. I helped him a bit with a couple of things in the comedian, very small, um, but he was nice and he appreciated. It. He's just a good guy. Louis, I've known for years, and and Ricky, I know pretty well, and and, and Gervais, uh, improved his part. Like I, I had written a whole bunch of stuff out, and he's so masterful and subtle with dialogue. But he wanted to insult me, so the whole thing about uh, please welcome uh, the little peeled turtle with AIDS, the king of cum guzzling. That was Ricky improving, yeah. and I left it because it was funnier than what I had written. When uh, De Niro was spanking me, uh, he I was over his knee. I didn't tell him I was going to do that. I actually waited till he was there before I asked him. It was not in the script. Yeah. Uh, I asked him, he, I was over his knee, and he goes, let's do one standing. And I'm like, okay, and that was the funniest. His instinct was right. Louis, I had slamming the door quicker, and Louis goes, just talk. I'll slam it when I feel it's right. That's the take we used. So that's the instinct he had. All three of those guys contributed something to it, and I, it's like as performers, they just knew what they were doing. So when you watched it, I'm like, th those choices were actually the best choices. So I was happy that they were, they were they're proactive enough to say what they wanted to do. So, so Jim, I, I, I really love watching Mouthful of Shame. I also uh, thank you. Love your your shows. You, you know all of them. You have you have radio shows. You have your UFC podcast. I also recommend people listen to the Joe Rogan podcast with you. Uh, read your books, even though you wrote them nine years ago. Read your next book whenever that comes out. Yeah. And uh, look, this stuff. You're the only person from high school I've seen, and it's been like 32 years. That's so right. good, good seeing you again. You too, buddy. Thank you. I'm happy you're doing well too. Your name's all over the place. Thanks a lot. For more from James, check out The James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network at jamesaltucher.com and get yourself on the free insiders list today. Hey there. Thanks for listening. Did you know I come out with new episodes every Tuesday? And actually now I'm thinking of coming out with more episodes per week. If you subscribe, you'll never miss an episode. And I have a lot of great interviews coming up. Just go to iTunes, search for The James Altucher Show, and click subscribe. And if you don't have iTunes, you can subscribe on Stitcher. Again, thank you so much. I really hope you do this. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information.